Hello, today on Storytime with Jen, we're gonna be reading Meet Chris Hadfield by Elizabeth McLeod, illustrated by Mike Diaz. Earth is so beautiful from up here. Look at all those colors and shapes. Gazing out the window of the International Space Station, Chris Hadfield grinned. He had wanted to be an astronaut since he was a kid. Chris had worked hard and trained for years. Now, on his third trip to space, he was in command of the mission. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I can't believe it. Wow, no one has ever walked on the moon before. When Chris was nine years old, he saw an incredible sight. On July 20th, 1969, Chris and his family were gathered with their neighbors around a television. All over the world, people tuned in to watch an astronaut walk on the moon for the very first time. Everyone cheered. Maybe, someday, I need to be ready. Chris couldn't stop thinking about what he'd seen. It was amazing. He began dr dreaming of being an astronaut. It seemed impossible. Canada didn't even have a space program, but Chris wondered if someday it might be possible. Oh no, the drawbar broke. We'll have to weld it again. Chris and his family lived on a farm in Milton, Ontario. He liked knowing how things work at worked and learned how to fix the farm machinery. Chris studied hard in school. When he was 13, he joined the Air Cadets. There, he learned about leadership and how to fly gliders. Let's go over the pre-flight checks again. Yes, sir. The exam th in a month. What extra practice questions can I do? After high school, Chris joined the Canadian Armed Forces. Many astronauts started their careers in the military. He went to military college and got a degree in mechanical engineering. Chris trained as a fighter pilot after college. He patrolled Canada's northern skies, but he still dreamed of going to space. Hornet 1, Tally 2, over. Chris went on to become a test pilot. He worked hard and was usually at the top of his class. He tested new systems, including ones to help save F-18 fighters in out-of-control situations. In 1983, six Canadians had been picked to train at the National Aeronautics Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in Houston, Texas. Chris's dream of going to space seemed a little more possible. Roberta Bondaire, Mark Garneau, Robert Thurst, Ken Money, Bajarni Trigivison, Steve McLean, maybe me too one day. <clears throat> Departure from controlled flight established, beginning test sequence now. Nine years later, Canada announced it was hiring more astronauts. Chris was ready. He sent in his application right away. More than 5,000 people applied. For months, Chris took tests, attended meetings, and answered questions. Then he waited for the results and waited. Would he get a chance to be an astronaut? So tell us what you would do in that kind of emergency. On June 8, 1992, Chris was chosen as one of Canada's four new astronauts. His first trip to space would take place in 1995. Chris would fly on a space shuttle to Mir, the Russian space station. Chris spent three years at NASA practicing the systems he'd be using in space and learning to speak Russian. On November 12, 1995, the shuttle lifted off and roared towards space. A few minutes later, Chris realized his face was sore. Was something wrong? No, he was smiling so much that he had cramps in his cheeks. Four, three, two, one, and lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Chris was a mission specialist and part of his role was to operate the Canada Arm. This series of jointed robotic arms was invented in Canada. It could grab satellites or spacecraft, make repairs and move supplies or even astronauts. Chris had practiced simulations or sims with the Canada Arm many times in his training. He was ready and did his job well. Chris returned to Earth after eight days. He had loved being on the space station. In 1997, Chris found out he'd be heading back into space. This time he was flying to the new International Space Station, ISS. 
The first section of the ISS went into orbit in 1998. It would take 12 years and 40 missions to transport all the sections of the ISS into space and assemble them. Chris and the other astronauts would arrive at the ISS in April 2001. They would help build new parts of it. That meant Chris would need to go outside the ISS and walk in space. Underwater is the closest we can get on Earth to the microgravity of space. Before a spacewalk, astronauts train in a huge swimming pool. They wear special suits, carefully weighted so they don't float or sink. Pants, tops, gloves, helmets, everything has to be watertight. It takes hours for astronauts to assemble their tools, discuss the day's training, and get helped into the bulky suits. Then they are lowered on a platform into the pool. It's harder to do this underwater than on land. It's good we practice over and over. On April 22, 2001, Chris stepped out of the ISS. He was the first Canadian to walk in space. Chris and his partner's job was to install the Canada Arm 2 on the ISS. The Canada Arm 2 was, is a larger, more advanced version of the robotic arm Chris used on the MER mission. Everything was going well until Chris suddenly got something in his eyes. They stung so much he couldn't open them. He was blind in space. No one knew what was wrong. Mission Control back on Earth told Chris to open a valve in his suit to vent the suit's air into space. Fresh air would be pumped into the suit from the tanks. Chris kept calm and slowly his eyes cleared. He was finally able to get back to work. Chris and his partner were out in space for more than seven hours. The rest of the work went according to plan. Later, NASA figured out that some of the liquid used to clean the visor on Chris's helmet had gotten into his eyes. Now they use different cleaners. Have you got that bolt tightened? Yes, we can move on to the next one. Just two days after his first spacewalk, which astronauts call an extravehicular activity or EVA, Chris left the ISS for his second he cleared his visor very carefully this time. During the EVA, Chris and his partner removed an old communications antenna from the ISS. They also moved equipment from the shuttle to a storage rack on one of the space station's labs. A week later, it was time for Chris to return home. It's like Earth is a ship and we're all traveling through space together. Houston calling, come in ISS, how's the weather up there today? Back on Earth, Chris worked at the Space Center in Houston. There, he trained other astronauts. Sometimes he worked with space, mi space missions where he was the voice of mission control. For two years, he was NASA's director of operations in Russia. He learned more about the Russian space systems and the cosmonauts. That's, what, that's the Russian term for astronauts. Chris loved his work, but he wondered if he'd ever get to go to space again. Chris had to wait many years, but in 2010, he found out he'd been chosen to go back to the ISS for 146 days, and this time, he would be in command. Chris knew he'd have to be totally prepared for the space, space mission. He would be responsible for the safety of the people on board and the station itself. Chris and his crew took two years to get ready for their mission. Today's the first sim with all three of us. It's going to be a cozy fit in here. It feels even smaller in here with all of our gear along for the ride. On December 19th, 2012, Chris and his two teammates prepared to blast off, blast off in the Russian Soyuz spacecraft to the ISS. It was very cold. To make sure they didn't freeze on their way to the launch pad, they wore pillowy snowsuits over their spacesuits. They waddled as they walked. As Chris climbed the stairs to the Soyuz, he noticed it was covered in ice but the spacecraft easily rocketed them to the ISS. The Soyuz docking probe is aligned for the final approach. Before astronauts arrive at the ISS, they train inside three-dimensional models of the space station. That way, when they come on board, they are prepared to get to work. The ISS is a solar-powered research lab that orbits around Earth. It was developed by the United States, Europe, Japan, Russia, and Canada. Usually, it has a crew of six. The ISS is the biggest spacecraft ever created and it costs more than $120 billion to build. It is made up of connected tubes and compartments where the astronauts live and work. By 2013, the ISS was as long as a football field. 
Sometimes for fun, the crew would have races from one end to the other, pushing off the walls and flying through the tubes. Ready to race? One end to the other. You're on. I'm feeling fast today. Any peach ambrosia left? It's my favorite. Almost as good as homemade. Good thing I didn't take the last one. Most of the food on the ISS is dry and in bags. Astronauts squirt water into the food, then mix it up and eat it right out of the bag. Five more kilometers. Gotta keep my muscles strong. Gravity is the force that keeps you on the ground. Astronauts don't feel gravity in space. This is tough on their bodies. Their muscles can become weak. To stay healthy, they work out for two hours every day. Blech, I'm missing having a sink and a shower. There is no running water on the station. When the crew brushes their teeth, they have to swallow the toothpaste. Finally, my turn. I better be careful not to spill anything. The ISS toilet is a small booth. There's a long hose coming out of the wall that sucks the waste away, but a few drops always escape. Each astronaut is careful to wipe the walls clean after. Chris and the crew kept busy checking that the equipment on the ISS was working properly. properly. They also did experiments. They tested how their hearts were working and grew plants in space. But Chris wanted to get people on Earth excited about space. Answering questions from schools and reporters and posting photos to Twitter were just some of the ways Chris helped people learn about space. He shared more than 100 videos from the ISS. Let's start wringing it out. It's really wet. It's becoming a tube of water. Lock your Soyuz hatch and put your helmet on. Chris loves playing the guitar. There was one on board the ISS. He sang, is somebody singing live with kids all across Canada? Chris also recorded a video of Space Oddity by rock superstar David Bowie. It was the first music video made in space. Millions of people on earth watched it. People like seeing the world through an astronaut's eyes. Chris showed them how beautiful and amazing space is. What can you tell us? Now we've seen an increase in that leak rate. Chris's 146 day mission was going well. It was almost over. Then one of the astronauts saw sparks flying from the side of the ISS. What was happening? Mission Control back on Earth said the space station was leaking a chemical called ammonia that keeps the station's power systems from getting too hot. There was a, this is very, was very serious. There was no time to run any sims for the repair. The new pump is in and there's no sign of a leak. Two astronauts had to go out and fix the leak. And I, as ISS commander, Chris stayed on board to coach them. Chris worked with Mission Control to direct the repairs, speaking both Russian and English. He stayed calm and took the astronauts through everything they needed to do. It took them more than five hours to stop the leak, but with Chris's help, they did it. The ISS and its crew were safe. Boy, that was quite a ride. Chris returned safely to Earth on May 13, 2013. Thanks to his songs, tweets, pictures, and videos, he became one of the most famous astronauts ever. Later that year, Chris retired from being an astronaut. He wrote books, including one for kids. How did you sleep in space? I was zipped into a sleeping bag attached to a wall. It's like resting on a cloud. Today, Chris travels around the world. He gives talks about what it's like to be an astronaut. He shares stories about the everyday things that are weird in space. By helping people see the world differently, he hopes they'll see its wonder. In his talks, Chris also reminds people that to reach your goals, you need to work hard and be prepared so that you will be ready for whatever adventures are ahead. Just like Chris. Chris Hadfield's life, August 29th, 1959. Chris Austin Hadfield is born in Sarnia, Ontario. July 20th, 1969, Chris watches the first moon landing on television. 1978, Chris joins the Canadian Armed Forces. 1982, Chris graduates from the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario with an engineering degree. Late 1980s, Chris attends test pilot school and works as a professional test pilot in the United States. June 8th, 1992, Chris is chosen to be an astronaut. November 12th to 20th, 1995, Chris makes his first space flight. He flies to Russia's Mir Space Station 
on mission STS-74. Chris is the only Canadian to have gone on a mission to Mir. April 19th to May 1st, 2001. Chris's second mission to space. He flies to the International Space Station on mission STS-100. April 22nd, 2001. Chris becomes the first Canadian to walk in space. 2001 to 2003. Chris is NASA's Director of Operations in Russia. December 19th, 2012. Chris leaves for his third trip to space, Expedition 3435. March 13th to May 13th, 2013. Chris is the first Canadian to be commander of the ISS. May 12th, 2013. Chris is the first person to ever record and broadcast a music video from space. July 3rd, 2013, Chris retires from the Canadian Space Agency. November 18th, 2015, Chris becomes an officer of the Order of Canada. September 10th, 2016, The Darkest Dark, Chris's first picture book is published. I'll have a link to that uh, in the description. So Chris, age five. Chris works on attaching the Canada Arm 2 to the outside of the International Space Station during his first spacewalk on April 22, 2001. This stamp was issued as part of a 2003 series honoring Canadian astronauts and Canada's achievements in space. Live from space via video link up, Chris does a question and answer session with students at Chris Hadfield Elementary School in Milton, Ontario the end. And that's it for today's episode of Storytime with Jen. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you tomorrow.